gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again, so very grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to just come together in this way and feast upon your word. I just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise, asking you, Lord, dear Lord, that you would just take and separate that which is foolish from that which is truth and just seal to our hearts that which is your word only, which will transform our lives. Guide us and instruct us, dear Lord, as we go forward through this study into the marvelous area of your coming for us. As we await your glorious appearing, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I've been kind of out of it for a few days. I got a little sick working out in the heat. But I think I'm back to pretty much back to normal. So we're going to continue on in our study in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this will be part 10. I think that uh, we're in chapter 4. And I think we pretty much left off at uh, somewhere around verse 9. So I'll pick up there at uh, verse 9. I want to, first of all, I want to thank you all for your continued prayers and your support of this ministry. Uh, these are, without a question, uh, these are most uh, interesting times that we're living through. We are most definitely living in a time in which doctrine, and, uh, and you've heard me talk about this, that uh, is not very popular. And, and yet it is so in, in, intrinsically a part of our walk, our relationship with the, with the Lord, our growth in grace and knowledge of Christ. It's in, it is impossible to look at it as inseparable from our Lord's return for us. I hope to point that out Early on, when I first began this ministry, and it was uh, Heavenly Sign 2017, uh, I don't think that my viewers, I think they, they very rarely ever heard me really even talk about doctrine in the sense that, uh, well, for the very reason that the ministry was all about uh, eschatology, and it, was, it, it touched very little on doctrine. We, I wasn't going through verse-by-verse -verse studies doing verse by verse videos, teaching videos, uh, and I only began doing that uh, when, when it, it became apparent that we were going to uh, be here for some uncertain amount of time. And I think that was somewhat of a mistake. I, I gained a large following which uh, anyone can do if, if, uh, uh, if you're a traveling, uh, I want to say salesman, you know, and you're going about and you're setting up a tent or, or you know, preaching uh, on the, the coming of the Lord, and that's, that's, that's all your ministry is about, is about the rapture or, or prophecy, and you don't really teach on doctrine, I think that you're, I don't really think that you're doing uh, scripture a service. I, I don't think, I don't think you're doing God a service. I don't think you're doing sc uh, justice to the word of God. Uh, maybe, I hope I'm making myself clear on this. Uh, I don't think we can separate the two. Beginning back in verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Uh, that's... Uh, Chapter one, verse three, is what is where my mind went back to, uh, right at the beginning of our study here, where Paul says, "Remembering without ceasing your labor of love." These believers there at Thessalonica, uh, God is commending them for their love toward one another. Chapter one, verse 
8 uh, just uh, right again once again right at the beginning of this study we we read for from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and, and uh, Achaia but also in every place your faith uh, toward God is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything so their testimony and their faith was also being, they were being commended for that. In, uh, in 5.1, the next chapter, the first verse in the next chapter, we're going to read, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. First uh, John chapter 2, verse 27, But the anointing which we have received of God abides in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. I don't teach you folks anything. Uh, the Holy Spirit teaches us all. He guides us, He directs us, He comforts us, He leads us. But more importantly, He teaches us because He, uh, it's, that's a whole entire sermon in and of itself. We think that we have this, this somehow we have this persuasive power on people to uh, to bring about not only uh, faith or belief in God, but actual uh, effectual change in their lives. And folks, that's just not true. Uh, John six forty five. We know from John six forty five. It is it is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. These are our Lord's own words. In 1 John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, uh, and they shall be all taught of God. 1 John three fourteen, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Love is something that we do. It's, an in, it's, a, it's for the believer in Christ, it's as natural as breathing. If we don't love one another, we're not, we we abide in darkness. We're not a, we're not of God. So, looking at all of this and taking it all together, I I see no contradiction re really here in God commanding that we do in one place what He says we actually do do in other places, or our being exhorted to love one another in one verse while He. Uh, so commends those for their love for one another in another verse, you know, and sees no need to write any further about it. Now, I remind you, these are not Paul's words. This is God's word we're looking at. Ye do it, God says, toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. I don't, I don't recall ever really asking any of my Facebook friends, that my devout, uh, the most devoted followers on Facebook, or you know, to uh, you know, commanding you know any of you to love one another. It's just something that I know that you do. It's a, it's another thing entirely, all different altogether. To to beseech you to 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 love one another more and more. Now, moving on to verse verse 12, uh, I found verse 12 very interesting, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. Uh, now, obviously, to me, that, that, that's talking to about non-believers, uh, those that are not a part of the body of Christ, and that you may have lack of nothing. Now, why would you not have lack of anything? Folks, the only reason that we would not have lack of anything, actually, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, in the strictest sense, it's a truism. We don't lack anything. We're not coming behind in any spiritual grace. But why would we not have lack of anything? Well, because we are trusting God. And I've emphasized in the past how important I believe that it is that we trust God above all things. It's what God desires of us the most. And so we walk honestly toward them that are without. We don't need to walk dishonestly when we know that God supplies our every need. That you may walk worthy toward them that are without. 
The word there actually in the Greek is proper. Walk properly toward them that are without. That you may have lack of nothing. Why? Because we're trusting God. And the next verse is interesting because it's, it, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Even as others which have no hope. Because why? Because they're not trusting God. So we have a stark contrast here between verse 12 and verse 13. Between us that we trust God and others who, who don't trust God. And, where the, and the word hope there is intrinsically related to that faith or that trust in God. Now that's, that's a great lead in to the, to the return of our Lord. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so now I suppose that we can just, you know, cease talking about doctrine, all this uh, magnificent doctrine, and we can just talk about the rapture. We can jump from, uh, you know, one thing to the other here. We can leave doctrine aside here now. We can just jump into eschatology and not, and not you know, we've already kind of looked at the doctrine aspect, doctrinal aspect of all this, and now we can just focus on the rapture. And Lord knows that, and, I, and I'm not lying here, God knows that there are more people, it seems today, more Christians today, that are, are much more interested in the Lord's return, the rapture, the tribulation, the mark of the beast, and on and on it goes, much more interested in that than, and in, than in doctrine. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I hardly know what what to to properly say about that. It's uh, when we study, folks, these two letters. All right, we'll discover that almost every major doctrine of the Christian faith is mentioned. And the doctrine of the of the return of Christ for the church, it, which it's it's that is a doctrine itself. That's a truth that ought to transform how we live as a corporate body of God's people. How we live. Now, without now naming names, I've tr I've tried to refrain from doing that. I'll just I'll just say that that I know of a sister in Christ who uh, is absolutely in, consumed with uh, the fact that the Lord is coming soon. But because of there being a lack of sound doctrine in her life, she looks at the rapture as something that is merit-based. Not every believer is going to be raptured. Only the good Christians are going to go, and those that are, aren't, weren't so good and didn't try so hard and didn't really just, you know, match up to her standards of, or her expectations of what a Christian ought to be, then they'll be left behind. Uh, why should it surprise any one of us that the religious world stands opposed, I mean, uh, violently opposed to the doctrine of grace. Every chapter 
I pointed this out. Every chapter ends with a reference to the coming of the Lord, and each reference relates the doctrine of His coming to some aspect of teaching, which is doctrine. Okay, the Greek word doctrine means teaching. And if there's if there is anything that Satan, the father of lies, hates, it's doctrine. He hates truth. He's the father of all lies. He hates, of course, he hates truth. And what is truth? Truth is doctrine. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. You got to remember Thessalonians was a home of, of a great number of cults. Many of the early converts there were pagans. In Revelation 12:4. Something that we're all very familiar with, or should be at this point. The dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be, be delivered for to, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard very few uh, prophetic ministries talk about the word devour. When? When did the dragon stand before the woman which was ready to be delivered for, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. When? When she, the woman, Israel, was ready to be delivered. That is, before the church began. Satan has been bent, folks, on destroying the male child which represents the body of Christ. Actually, it represents Christ and His body, both, Okay? You can't separate the church from Christ because we are His body. And He's been, he's been hell-bent on destroying the male child, the body of Christ, ever since the church came into existence. Israel brought forth the Messiah. Judaism gave birth to Christianity, which is His body. Satan's been uh, determined to destroy the church from its conception. The text is not saying that, that just in these final you know, few hours before Christ returns, the dragon is seeking to devour the child. That's not what the text is saying. He has stood before God accusing the brethren for nearly 2,000 years. Okay? He's worked to undermine the gospel of Christ for nearly 2,000 years. Believe me, that is his primary objective. His primary goal is to corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, if you've been a follower of this ministry, you know how I define the gospel of Christ. To denigrate Christ, to blaspheme Christ in His finished work for 2,000 years. The devil could care less if you quit trying to do bad stuff. You know, quit trying to compete with Christ, rest in the perfect finished work of Christ, and the devil becomes enraged. Okay? In fact, he'd have you dead if, if he had his way about it. You take leave of the world religious system based on human merit. You, you come out and you become separate from that world religious system based on human merit. And you trust God concerning your salvation and He will pursue you like the hound of hell that He is. Okay? He seeks to rob you of precious truth that will transform your life he seeks to devour any born-again child of God that is being conformed unto the image of Christ because he hates Christ and he hates you. He doesn't care if you sit in church all day as long as you're not trusting God. His messengers minister false doctrines of demons which elevate and promote self-righteousness and self-glory. He encourages you into the lifetime uh, bondage, the shackles of law-keeping as a principle of life, a, a principle of so-called devotion and dedication to 
Christian service. He despises the true gospel. He despises sound doctrine. It would thrill Satan to death to be able to assign you to a lifetime service of, of housing the homeless and feeding the hungry if he knew that he would keep you from hearing the Word of God. His, his messengers masquerade as an angel of light. The Christian life stands upon the foundation of sound doctrine. Okay? Our, our whole relationship rests upon, stands upon, is built upon that foundation of, a foundation of truth. Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. Our lives, folks, they rise and they fall, okay, on the principle of sound doctrine. And here we are waiting, awaiting the, the, our removal, our departure, the harpazo, the rapture of the church. And we want to separate sound doctrine from that. We live, we live in a time in which doctrine is a bad word. It's, just, it's, it's a bad word on the lips of many sincere Christians because they think that doctrine divides. Actually, it's, it's intended to. We don't need to come, in, come into unity, folks. We are one with Him as, as He is one with the Father. Unity isn't something that you, we, they have conferences on trying to, on how we you know ought to get together and, and create this unity, folks. The unity exists. We live in a time in which doctrine is is despised. It's it's no wonder these videos get so few views, so little attention doesn't surprise me at all. The t For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. Second Timothy 4, Paul calls them cleverly devised fables. Or, or maybe that's Peter, second in Second Peter, chapter one. So, do you honestly believe that the subject of the rapture is somehow separate from the matter of doctrine? How, why would we even dare think that there was no relationship between doctrine and the, our coming uh, our, to to meet the Lord, the Lord's coming, where that we meet Him in the air? You know, I looked at these. I looked at that word, devour. I found that very interesting. I, I want to. I've got to pass this along to you here. I, according to the uh, the most uh, reliable concordances, that uh, Strong's being one of them. Fifth, uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. There's 15 occurrences of the word devour. 15. Uh, and so I want to I want to quickly I want to go over these these fifteen. It won't take but a moment. Uh, uh, I, I can't help but find this interesting. In looking at these fifteen, we see that, and there's also this rule of first occurrences. The first time that we see it is the birds who devoured or who ate up, which is what the word devour means. It means to eat up, ate up the seed that the farmer sowed. Okay. That's the gospel. Now, some may argue, well, that's the gospel of the kingdom there, but it uh, doesn't make any difference. The birds devoured. They ate up the seed the farmer sowed. Doctrine. We see the word used in the prodigal son who devoured. He squandered his wealth, his inheritance. He squandered his inheritance. Well, that's, that's symbolic of doctrine. The Pharisees who devour widows' houses, that is, rob them of sound doctrine. We see the word uh, used in Jesus being, Jesus was devoured. 
He was eaten up. Like I said, the word means eaten up. Eaten up with zeal over his father's house. That is the temple. Zeal in relationship to the temple. Doctrine. John devoured the little book in, in Revelation. Prophecy. We're looking at doctrine. We see the word used as in our being consumed or devoured by false teaching or false teachers or injured by false doctrine. We see the word used there too. We, we see the word used in the sense of believers devouring one another. What do you think that is? You know, it's, that's not, uh, it's not to be taken literally, you know, uh, like we're, we're cannibals or anything. That's, we devour one another figuratively in the sense that we injure one another by false doctrine. We see the two witnesses devouring their enemies who would cause them harm by fire. What, is, what does fire represent? Judgment. And, and that judgment comes out of their mouth. Okay? All right? The, the two witnesses, folks, are, I, don't, I don't believe we can look at that as them being two fire-breathing dragons. Okay? Or two, two individuals, two human beings, in which literal fire comes out of their mouth and, can, and uh, consumes or devours their enemies. This is, li this is figurative liter literal. Okay? To be interpreted in a, in, a, in a common sense way, it's judgment that comes out of their mouth. What is their mouth doing? It's speaking truth. Okay? And what is it that they're speaking? Well, they're preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. So it's the gospel again. It's doctrine. So these two witnesses devour their enemies who would wish to cause them harm. And then we see the dragon who stood ready to devour the male child. What is the church? Doctrine. Doctrine, folks. Doctrine. Okay? And when we look at that word doctrine, there are 30 occurrences of the word doctrine. I don't have time to go through all of those. Let's don't forget what has, what has preceded uh, Paul's mention of the rapture here in this chapter. What, is, what have we been looking at? All right. We're to walk in a way that's pleasing to God. We're to abound more and more in that. We're to keep the commandments in the Lord. Abstain from the fornication. We're told to, that we, we should possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Not to defraud our brother in any matter. That God called us unto holiness. We do stand before God without spot, without blame. We're to love the brethren more and more. We're to study to be quiet, mind our own business, work with our own hands, no matter what it is we do. We're to walk honestly toward them, properly toward them that are without. Walk as blameless, because that's who we are. Not rob one another of this truth, or there will be consequences in this life. Okay? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but there is, we reap what we sow. Okay? You do love one another. We do love one another. So we're to love one another more and more. We're not to butt into other people's business. We're to mind our own business. Why? Because you have been set apart by God for service regarding things which are holy. God will provide our needs. And then we see that we're going to be raptured along with those who now sleep and that we'll be forever with the Lord and we're to comfort one another with these words you know suddenly seized by force strong word harpazo into clouds into a meeting with the lord into air says the greek into air air being symbolic of the breath of life not to say that it won't be literal that we won't literally be in the air but it's worth pointing out that air is is symbolic of the breath of life itself it's it's that which god breathed into adam he, he breathes life into us both physically and spiritually it represents the spirit pneuma in the greek where we get our word pneumatic like uh, you have pneumatic tools 
has to run off a compressor of air. As I, as I pointed out previously, all five chapters of 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to Christ's return. All five. You know, chapter one, no judgment. Chapter two, we're God's family who stand in, in chapter three, unblameable until chapter four, the rapture, which is what we're looking at here. And in chapter five, we're secure because God's faithful. That's what you'll see. Doctrine, folks, doctrine. Sound biblical doctrine surrounds this passage on the rapture. In fact, the truth concerning the rapture itself is a doctrine. It is sound biblical doctrine. It's my personal belief that, that, uh, that God, first and foremost, not just Paul, you know, God who authored these words we were given, he wants us to not just be comforted, but comfort one another concerning the fact that we have, as our blessed hope, the sure guarantee of a, which is the word hope, is guaranteed expectation. It's not wishful thinking. It's not hope in the sense, well, I hope, I wish, you know, I really do hope that, you know, I win the lottery. Guaranteed hope. Of, of, of a final deliverance from a sin-sick body, a sin-sick world that's becoming sicker by the day, obviously, right in front of our eyes, that has, for the most part, rejected and despised God's Son, God's people, God's Word, which is doctrine. If, if remove sound doctrine, folks, from the picture, and we don't have a rapture. We have no deliverance. We have no relationship with God. We have nothing to guide us through this darkened world. We have no hope in this world. We would only sorrow, sorrow as do others who have no hope. I've been to enough funerals to know that, know how that is. Our lifespan here on earth <laughs> It doesn't contain the length that we don't we don't live long enough to really to to be able to ad just adequately describe our life in Christ. We we're not here that long, folks. It's not like we lived back, you know, when uh, in the days of you know Adam or Methuselah. And some of you folks, you've come here over time. You've come here to better identify the miseries that that plague our lives, the hope that we have in us, the the our interest in the coming of the Lord, and 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 more importantly, I believe you know uh, a better understanding of uh, our walk in of this walk of grace, the the true gospel, uh, the truth which changes our lives, which frees us from bondage. All of that. You've come here. To better understand that, uh, we're all on that same journey, that same walk together. You know, and and you've seen just how far that you might have wandered from from a perf from such a perfect beginning, okay? Or that uh, you were uh, placed into chains, into bondage. That we talk, I've talked, I know I've talked about some of the problems that, that have kept us in bondage to our old self. Uh, and you've learned. You've learned that what appears to be holy and good is in fact an instrument of death in our spiritual walk because to live by the law is spiritual adultery and death. And, and I have emphasized, I've encouraged you to look at the cure, to look at what I believe is, it's, it's not summed up in things, but it's summed up in a person, Jesus Christ. He's, he's the cure-all for our problems, all of our problems, all of our confusion, all of our disillusionment can be summed up in two words, Jesus Christ. There are no steps to the cure. He is the cure. 
and the cure is the work of God himself. He desires a uh, personal, vital, living encounter with us here and now. We don't have to wait for that, for that trumpet to sound to experience that. He would have us know Him and know, know that intimacy that exists, that, that tender degree of intimacy that exists between you and your Lord. You can know that now as you await, okay? And apart from understanding these things, these, these precious truths of, 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 that He has given us, the, you know, the abject need to know, we are bound to flounder in a sea of unknowing despair. We need to know who we are. We need to know our position. We need to know our position in Christ, how God views us, which is as righteous as His Son. We need to understand our condition and not be confused about our, our position, not allow our condition to dictate what, how we understand our position. We need to trust Him. We need to trust Him that His truth is effective in our lives, that His sovereignty covers all circumstances in our lives, that, that His goodness assures our best is foremost with Him. He would have us all know this now. There's coming a time, folks, where we won't need all that because we'll be in His presence. It's not, it's, at least in my humble opinion, folks, it's not good enough to just sit around and wait and not work with our hands, to rely on the world to supply our needs. To struggle to love one another. It, it's not... And just throw up our hands, you know, sort of in a sense that as so many have done in the past and so many are even doing today and just throw up your hands and just say, well, the Lord's coming soon. You know, why worry about anything? Don't you have an intense desire to know Him? I remember asking the Lord many, 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 many years ago. Lord, I don't just want to know things about you. I want to know you. And God, I believe, fulfilled that desire and He honored that desire because He put that desire there and He fulfilled that desire in my heart. It's one thing to have a head full of knowledge about things of the Lord. It's another thing to, for that knowledge to, to be an experiential knowledge where that and I'm not talking about some charismatic experience. I'm not talking about dreams and visions and, and all this other junk. I'm talking about knowing Him through His Word how, and seeing how that His Word literally takes and transforms our lives. We're transformed by the truth of this book. And we only have this one shot, this one chance at it. And once it's over, once, once it's done, it's done. Once He comes, that's it. That's it. I guess it just kind of boils down on to just how much, what are you willing to, to settle for? Something mediocre? Something... Anyhow, this is where we're going to pick up next, uh, next video. It'll be part 11. We're going to pick up a little more here in this passage concerning the rapture. I have a lot to say about those uh, who will be raised first. Many of you might know uh, from past videos uh, just what I might be have to say about that. Anyway, I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you for all your continued prayers. This ministry so needs your prayers. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.